In today's episode, we have a case study. We're going over post-operative meniscus repair, physical therapy, rehabilitation, and two-time national powerlifting champion, Chrissy Paraki. Let's do it. So what's the big problem with meniscus repair rehabilitation? The rehab protocols are all over the place. <clears throat> you may have a patient on Monday morning, 7 a.m., first patient of the day. It's a meniscus repair. You take a look at the protocol from the surgeon, and it says toe touch weight bearing for four weeks, followed by partial weight bearing two weeks with the knee locked in extension. And then the patient is finally weight bearing is tolerated at week six for two weeks. And then they can walk without the brace at week eight, right? You may also find a lot of range of motion restrictions. So for a lot of these, you'll see week zero to six, knee flexion is limited to 90 degrees. And then afterwards, you slowly increase. Let's say you have another meniscus repair patient late in the day, different doctor, very, very similar type of meniscus tear. And the protocol says, hey, just go for it. No restrictions. Okay. Now, obviously, it's a problem. We don't know what to do with these patients. It'd be nice to have some better guidance. So I actually did a review of the evidence. And I made an entire Fitness Pain-Free Show episode about this, and I'll leave that link in the show notes. But today's episode is not about that. Uh, the problem I see is not a lot of seasoned clinicians will actually share what they do from a physical therapy perspective. And that's something I feel pretty strongly about that I want to try to do. So today we're going to exactly how I did post-op um, meniscus repair physical therapy in one of my patients, A to Z where she started and where she ended up when she competed and actually won a national championship after rehabilitation uh, with a powerlifter. Her name is Chrissy Paraki. So in today's episode, we're going to go over the initial diagnosis for our patient. What was the mechanism of injury? What special tests that we used? What did the range of motion look like? What were the treatments we used? What was the prior injury history for this individual? I got a chance to actually work with her before she had surgery. So what did that look like? Next, we referred to a surgeon. What were we looking for in a surgeon? How did that go? We talk about the surgery specifics. So what type of tear were we working with, right? And what was the repair like? What did early physical therapy look like? What did things look like as we progressed and got to the advanced stages? And then I talk a little bit about discharge and future injury prevention. What's kind of cool is that um, Chrissy came into her rehab as a national champion, and she ended up not winning the following national championship, but the one afterwards she won again. So pretty cool to see someone come back from a major injury like this and then find success at the highest level. Welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like yourself get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. My name is Dan Pope. I am a physical therapist, a coach, a personal trainer, and a meathead. I love all things strength and fitness. I have my dream job as a physical therapist, coach, business owner, and educator. I've been doing this for several decades now, and I want to help you reach your goals, right? So you can lead a cool life the way I feel I do. Before we really get going, I made a meniscus pathology cheat sheet. So if you're not too familiar with meniscus tears, meniscus rehabilitation, what treatment generally looks like, the basics behind meniscus pathology, don't worry, I actually made a cheat sheet for you. It's evidence-based. We go over meniscus tear prevalence, anatomy, mechanisms of injury, clinical presentation, evaluation and diagnosis, treatment steps, excuse me, treatment strategies, surgical considerations, and best of all, it's all free. I'm going to leave a link in the bio. Definitely go check that out, get you up to speed so you know what I'm talking about in these next few slides. So who are we talking about in the case study today? We're talking about Chrissy Paraki. Um, one of the reasons why I thought she was a really cool case study is because I tend to work with a lot of strength and fitness athletes, and I want to show you exactly how you can do the same. And it's really nice when you have a case study of the athlete that you want to try to teach others about. Chrissy is a phenomenal person and a phenomenal athlete. A little specifics about her. She's a 31 year old female currently. And she's a two-time national champion in USAPL in 2019 and 2022 in the 56 kilogram uh, class. It's pretty neat because she came to see me after a major injury kind of during COVID. And her goal was kind of to get back to compete again at nationals. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, but she did not win nationals when she came back from her first surgery. But actually, she won nationals the following year. So really cool case study. I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, she also has a pretty prominent prior injury history. I'll talk a little more about this later, 
but she had two prior ACL tears, one on each side, and that definitely affects future rehabilitation. So one of the first questions I start asking when athletes are going in for surgery, when they're considering surgery or they just had surgery, we want to talk a lot about their competitive season. When do they need to be back by? All right. So we want to make sure that we're being reasonable with the patient's expectations and we develop a really good plan that gets them back to where they need to be by when they need to be ready. Right. So for Chrissy, she wanted to be ready for nationals, which was going to be in June of that year. Right. So we just talked about the timeline that she had for that, which ended up being pretty reasonable. And we just we were just gunning for it the entire time. Um, and it was nice because it gives us I don't want to say tunnel vision, but it gives us a, an idea of what our goals are. And we can really make good decisions to get to that goal as best as we can. Right. And if she didn't have that type of runway. Right. So she had kind of a quick turnaround from surgery to nationals then I probably would have done things a little bit differently, but um, we were able to try to push because we had planned in the beginning, right? So from a psychosocial perspective, um, what was Chrissy like? Well, she's extremely dedicated and hardworking, right? So anyone who's competed at the elite level has to be extremely hardworking generally, and she definitely is. Uh, she's that type of athlete that will just run through a brick wall. Her coach says, hey, if you want to win nationals, all you have to do is run through this brick wall. She'll run through it 10 times, right? Definitely one of those athletes. The other thing was pretty cool about Chrissy is that it's not her first injury, right? She really understands this process. Um, she's been through it several times before. Uh, one of the things you will see for athletes after their first injury, they don't know what to expect. And I think from a psychological perspective, it puts them into a, a tailspin. To steal some words from Chris Johnson, when you're an athlete and you have an injury, a major injury, it is an identity crisis, which means that as an athlete, your sense of self, your value to the world is all wrapped up in your ability to be a super high level athlete. And once you get an injury, you feel worthless. Your sense of value is just crushed, right? And you're really concerned that you're not going to be able to get back to where you want to be. And all of that depression, and anxiety kind of keeps you from wanting to be able to progress in the future. And for new people that get injured for the first time, this can often really derail their rehabilitation. For Chrissy, this wasn't really the case. Obviously, it's extremely hard to have an injury uh, like this. However, she's done it several times before. So that was helpful. All right. Uh, Chrissy does have a very strong athletic identity as she should. I'm not trying to take that away from her or any other athlete. Uh, what she does is very cool, very valuable. So a major injury like that really sidelines her, right? So one of the other things that was challenging is that Chrissy kind of got hurt during COVID. Uh, I tend to get a lot of mask hate <laughs> on fitness pain free. Um, and the reason why we have a lot of masks why, through this presentation, you'll see the pictures is simply because this was during COVID. However, it was actually kind of tough for her to find a place to work out, the equipment she needed. That was a little bit challenging throughout the process. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. So I made a mini course that's absolutely free. That's the next logical step if you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective, but doesn't really teach you how to work with high level athletes in the fitness world, right? Doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. Doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym. Doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over. Seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to getting your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. It's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym, but if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay. So I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. Once you sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course, you will be automatically placed in the wait list for the fitness pain-free certification. Now, the fitness pain-free certification is the course, the certification that I wish I had as a new grad that fills in all the gaps in knowledge that you don't get in physical therapy school. 
So A, you'll gain complete confidence working with injuries in the strength and fitness world. You'll learn optimal technique for both health and performance from myself and some of the best coaches in the world. You'll master programming for rehabilitation and injury prevention. Have fun while earning a whole bunch of physical therapy and physical therapy assistance credits. You have 31.5 of those. You'll also gain NSCA credits as well as CrossFit credits if you need those. This is the equivalent of a university education in working with injuries in the weight room. I really believe that. I've been adding to this thing over the past five or six years. It's massive, a ton of phenomenal information. And lastly, the biggest goal is just to fill your day with the patients you love working with and building the respect and admiration of the communities you love working with. So I'll leave a link in the show notes. Sign up for the Fitness Pain-Free Mini Course. The certification is open four times per year for one week to enroll into. If you're on the wait list by signing up for the Fitness Pain-Free Mini Course, I'll alert you when that next enrollment period is open and you can get started. Let's get back to the show now. So like I said, Chrissy had a variety of prior injuries that were very severe. So she had ACL reconstruction with medial meniscus repair when she was 24 years old previously. Um, on the same side leg. And she also had an ACL reconstruction on the contralateral leg as well, as well as a few meniscectomies along the way. So she's a seasoned rehabber. I'm going to tell you what, I don't see a ton of meniscus pathology in powerlifters. But what I do tend to see are folks that played a sport, contact sport, uh, soccer, some sort of field sport, a lot of running, cutting, twisting, They'll have some sort of major ligament injury or some sort, of, some sort of meniscus pathology. And when they start powerlifting, every once in a while, they have these flare-ups. And that's potentially because they hurt themselves previously, right? So I don't think that powerlifting creates a ton of meniscus pathology. But if folks are coming into powerlifting and starting to compete in a high level, have a history of meniscus pathology, sometimes this makes this a little bit worse, which is what I think happened to Chrissy, Right. But the other thing I just talked about is she's going to be a seasoned rehabber just because she's done this several times before, which makes my life a little bit easier. So what was the story behind this injury? Well, first and foremost, like I said, she's had pain problems off and on for a while now. <clears throat> so she was dancing with her niece and she felt this kind of weird popping sensation in her knee. Oh crap. Right. She kind of felt what it was, thought it was probably some sort of meniscus injury. Right but kind of rehabbed a little bit herself. And she just noticed over the course of time, it get a little bit better then a little bit worse. Right. Then one day she was shoveling snow, right. Grabbed some snow in the shovel, threw it over her shoulder, kind of twisted to get down there. And yep. Another incident. She had that kind of painful, a little bit of a popping sensation. And then her knee became locked. Right. And it had actually become locked a few times in the past, but she was kind of able to free it up and continue about her activities and kind of rehab herself. And this time she really wasn't able to. So she came to see me, right? So she kind of hobbled through the door. Her knee was bent, probably like a 25 degree uh, amount of knee flexion. So, you know, the hobble was real. It was objectively locked. So we couldn't move it. It got stuck at that 25 degrees, right? And she came in to see me. And I did a lot of joint mobilizations, distractions, range of motion, soft tissue work. And we actually were able to get it unlocked, right? So by the end of the session, it unlocked. She was super pumped about it, right? And uh, she was able to walk out the door and kind of start training again, right? The thing was, it never really got back to the point where she could train well, right? So she went to go see her old surgeon. And the surgeon went ahead and just ordered some imaging. And what they found was a bucket handle tear on the medial side of the joint. It's a vertical longitudinal tear. If you're watching this on the video podcast version, I have an image of a meniscus tear. However, this is not a vertical longitudinal tear that I'm showing. This is going to be more of a radial tear. For the bucket handle tears, you end up having a tear vertically. It can flap over and get stuck in the joint. And that's probably what that objective locking is, um, the meniscus being caught in the joint and not being able to fully straighten out the leg. So we got to figure out what are the next steps, right? And generally speaking, you get a little feedback from the physical therapist, from the surgeon. I think surgeon ultimately is providing the most feedback here. Um, if a physical therapist is very well versed in the research on meniscus pathology and outcomes from surgery, I think they can give some guidance as well. I try to do this with my patients as much as I can. Uh, if you don't know the outcomes, if you don't know the research, then just make sure you have a really good surgeon 
who's not going to jump to surgery too quickly, right? And kind of give the patient really good feedback because ultimately the patient is the one who makes the decision, right? And Chrissy went along with the decision to repair the area. She wasn't given the option to trim the meniscus, which I think is good. I trust the surgeon. She's had several successful um, surgeries with that same surgeon. So I think that was a good idea. And the idea, and if you guys want some more information about deciding whether or not you should do uh, meniscus surgery, I did a whole podcast episode about it, a whole fitness pain free show. So leave that link in the show notes. But the idea is that if you repair the meniscus, you have less osteoarthritis in the future. Okay. So ultimately, that was the decision that Chrissy went with, right? At the end of the day, she couldn't get back to her training after a lot of rehab anyway. So in order to accomplish her goals, wants to win another national championship, that's what she, that's what she decided to do. Next, we'll talk a little bit about training age. So Chrissy is a, a seasoned powerlifter and also a seasoned athlete. She's competing at a high level in multiple sports over the course of time, and she is a pro in the weight room. So this is an important consideration because it's going to influence how she does a rehabilitation. If you have someone who's very green with weight training, then once they get to the point where you start doing weight training in the rehab, it actually is a little more challenging. You have to teach optimal technique. You have to have some eyes on them a little bit more. Uh, for Chrissy, that's not a problem. She knows how to train in the gym. She knows good technique. And for me, that made things a lot easier. Plus, I didn't have to watch her do all of her rehabilitation because I trust that she can do things appropriately. So once I watch her do maybe the exercises for the first time and I'm confident she can do it on her own, she goes off and do and does that on her own and doesn't need to do the majority of her exercise-based physical therapy with me. So what goals did Chrissy have? Now, I love this question. I recommend every physical therapist be direct with their patients and ask them what are your goals, right? Both with the current session and long term, right? What can I help you uh, do as a physical therapist and what do you want to get out of this physical therapy stint, right? So for Chrissy, she wants to make the best long-term choices. She understands that, hey, she wants to get back to powerlifting, but she also knows that she wants to be able to lift weights for the rest of her life and be healthy. So she wanted the best long-term choice for that, which is one of the reasons why she ended up doing the meniscus repair, right? The other, piece, the other piece is that she wants to return to powerlifting. She wants to earn another national title. That's exactly what she wants to do, okay? So she ended up, um, having the surgery in January of 2021 and nationals was June of 2021, right? So that's around six months turnaround from surgery date to competition. Now, is it reasonable for Chrissy to get back to competing at a high level by six months? Could you return to sport by six months? Yeah, I think so. However, I don't think that's a good runway to get yourself back to peak condition. Okay. So at least in my mind, when she asked me, Hey, can I kind of get back and compete at nationals? Yeah, definitely. You have enough time to do that. Will you be as strong as you want to be? Maybe not. We'll talk about how that went and the rest of this, uh, this fitness pain free show. Uh, but yeah, that was one of the thoughts that was going through my mind. I don't want to set her up for failure. I do think we have a long enough runway, but the other piece in the back of my mind is that it's, it may be a little unreasonable to think that you're going to be peaking at that time period. So like I said, I had the opportunity to see Chrissy before she went in for surgery. So what did things look like when she came hobbling through the door, right? <clears throat> so first and foremost, she had tenors to palpation on the medial joint line on the right side. Chrissy had a, a history of medial joint uh, issues, right? Meniscus repairs and meniscectomies. She kind of was familiar with that pain. It felt similar to the pain she had in the past, right? When I poked around on the medial joint line, I did notice some tenderness, right? She also had a bit of swelling in that area. I would say mid, min to mod. It wasn't like super blown up like some of these acute injuries can be. Uh, we definitely saw some swelling. A uh, little fun fact about Chrissy, when she tore her ACL previously, no swelling. Generally, you think that folks will tear their ACL and the knee will blow up. And I would say that's typical. But sometimes people will fully tear their ACL and there's no swelling at all, right? So she had pain with knee flexion. We didn't have to go to end range. It started to really kick in around 100 degrees of knee flexion. We did a McMurray test. That was also positive. She had pain with knee extension, and she wasn't able to reach full knee extension. She was at 20 degrees, and it was objectively locked, right? So I couldn't push it myself. She wasn't able to push it herself. It was stuck in that position, okay? Like I said, I was able to unlock it. What did I do? I did some soft tissue work to the calf. 
to the hamstring, a lot of range of motion work. I did some glides to the joint. I did some distraction with knee flexes, and that was able to kind of dislodge that bucket handle tear to the point where she could straight on her leg, and she felt much, much better, all right? However, over the next few weeks, she wasn't able to regain her strength the way she'd like to. Uh, she was coming up on that deadline that she knew um, in June she'd have to compete right, to try to defend her title as a national champion. So she decided to go see the physician. And right after she saw the physician with some imaging, she made the decision, like I said, to go through with the surgery. Uh, if you're watching the video podcast version on this on YouTube or Spotify, I have a meniscus composite score up here on the right. So if someone comes in to your clinic with these findings, right? You can be pretty dang sure that she has some meniscus pathology. She had the entire composite score positive. So a history of locking pain with hyperextension, pain with flexion, joint line tenderness, and pain or audible clicking with McMurray's maneuver. She has a 99% specificity chance of having a meniscus tear. So we were relatively certain with what we were dealing with when she came in through the door. So Chrissy had surgery and success. So after someone has a surgery, I like to take a look at the report and then make sure that I have a protocol coming from the surgeon, right? So a lot of surgeons will trust you with what you are uh, doing from a protocol perspective, but just make sure if you have no idea what that surgeon wants, you ask for some sort of protocol. Uh, because in this case, the surgeon is actually quite conservative. So in terms of contraindications, what did the protocol say? So first and foremost, we were non-weight bearing for four weeks. So she came in with crutches, right? And the reason why surgeons do this is obviously because they want to protect the surgical site, protect the meniscus, right? The only problem with this is if you spend a significant amount of time in non-weight bearing, you have more atrophy. So if a surgeon is deciding to keep someone non-weight bearing for longer, they're probably extending the period of time it's going to take to get back to activity and get back to sport, all right? She was limited to 90 degrees of knee flexion for four weeks, and then she was weight-bearing as tolerated at week four to week six, but she had to be locked into extension in her brace, okay? Again, this is actually quite tough for patients because she's four weeks non-weight-bearing and then has another two weeks where she's weight-bearing as tolerated, but I'll tell you what, your quad is not doing much work if you're weight-bearing as tolerated and locked into full extension. So you're going to get even more weakness, which ends up being a big problem. We'll talk about how we fixed it, but you know, you just have your work cut out for you more so as a physical therapist if you have a surgeon that's going to be really strict about weight-bearing, okay? After six weeks, she was weight-bearing as tolerated without the brace, and she was instructed to start physical therapy around two weeks after surgery, which is pretty common from what I see with docs locally in the Boston areas. In the meantime, she was given basic exercises to do, like quad sets, excuse me, quad sets, straight leg raise, long arc quads, just a couple exercises to do on her own before she ended up seeing me. So physical therapy started at week two, and my notes from that session when we first started were that the incisions were dry and healing, there was no sign of infection, no signs of DVT. I always try to educate the patient about what that might look like, to make sure they don't get into hot water at some point. Uh, there was moderate swelling. Uh, swelling can cause pain, can keep the quad from contracting the way we want to. So we want to try to focus on that in the future. She had a moderate quad contraction deficit. So basically, I'll have the patient lie on their back. I'll have them flex their non-involved side to get a, a feel for how that quad contracts. And then I'll have them flex the quad on the surgical side. And I often tell folks that their quads feel like a bowl of mashed potatoes probably not the thing to say to them because it gives them a bunch of fear. But that's kind of what it feels like, right? So when you feel someone trying to flex your quad after they just had a knee surgery, like a meniscus repair, it's often um, a little soft, a little squishy. It doesn't have that same kind of fullness. The patient may have trouble activating. It might be like a little bit of a contract and then stop contracting, contract, stop contracting. So uh, the motor control is not quite there. Okay. The other piece that was really tough with Chrissy is that she had a lot of atrophy. And I think the reason why this is, is because she had a lot of hypertrophy before, right? And she worked really hard to keep it around. 
She's a natural athlete. She competes in a drug tested federation. So she doesn't have the anabolic support to keep her muscle mass around. So she's non weight bearing. She's not training. And then she lost so much muscle mass in her quads. And I'll show you some pictures later. Cause it's pretty interesting to see the befores and afters. And then where we got to, you know, seven months later from a range of motion perspective, her knee flexion on the left side, full range around 135. On the right, we stopped at 90 because that's what the protocol wanted. In terms of extension, on the left side, she has about negative two, so two degrees of hyperextension. On the right, she was about seven degrees short of neutral, right? So she couldn't get to full extension, which is obviously something we're going to try to work on early on. So the next question I get a lot is, what kind of protocol do you like to follow, Right. Um, and this is a little bit confusing because we don't have a ton of great research guiding us. However, I do like this study and I'll, you can see, <laughs> you can see the citation here. If you want to check it out, if you're watching the video podcast, but I will put a link in the bio if you want to check it out. So this was in the journal of exploration orthopedics. Sorry, that's abbreviated. I'm not exactly sure the name of the, uh, the journal there, 2022 article. So it's recent called Rehabilitation and Return to Sports After Isolated Meniscus Repairs, a new evidence-based protocol. You guys can definitely check that out. That'll be in the references uh, in the show notes. Here's what I want you to do next, guys. So if you like this show and you want to learn more, I recommend watching this episode. It is Post-Op Meniscus Repair Physical Therapy, an evidence-based guide. What I've done is I've combed through the medical literature on meniscus repair surgery, giving recommendations based on the literature of what you should do in terms of knee range of motion, weight bearing, timelines for that, return to sport, all of that. So go ahead and click on that link. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put it right up above. And if you're not, you're listening to this, right? Then you can just go into the show notes and then download it from there and watch it. So definitely check that out. So that's it for today's podcast. Stick around next week where we'll do some more meniscus talk. And lastly, I just want to give you guys a big thank you. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to this on a podcast format, please leave me a positive rating and review. It helps me out tremendously. And then lastly, if you want to go that extra step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So all you have to do is head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders Library. You have a one-week trial for $1, super duper cheap. If you want to check out that knee exercise prescription lesson I was talking about, you can do it right here. I will leave a link in the show notes for you to check it out. Thanks again.